Welcome to JFK and the Enduring Secret. I'm your host, Jeff Crudell. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the podcast. Today's episode is episode 30. I really hope that you're enjoying this Memorial Day weekend. It's the first Memorial Day weekend that we've been able to enjoy a little bit of time outside, somewhat unrestrained in a post-COVID environment. So I hope you're getting a chance to really do the things you want to do and still finding a little time to listen to some of these episodes. In today's episode, we continue what we started in episode 29. We'll be covering four specific witnesses. James Worrell, Ronald Fisher, Robert Edwin Edwards, and the inmates at the jail. So, without further ado, let's listen to episode 30. James Richard Worrell, Jr. Mr. Worrell was 18 years old at the time of the assassination. He was attending Thomas Jefferson High School in Dallas, and he was in his senior year. Worrell was attending classes up until the month before the assassination. He quit school in October of that year. He was, by his own admission, an average student. He was unemployed at the time of the assassination and was also unemployed at the time he testified before the Warren Commission in March 1964. As Worrells tells his story, he went to Love Field that morning on the 22nd, and he got there before the president arrived. It wasn't long before he realized that he was going to see very little of the president at Love Field, and he was going to have to go somewhere else to get more of a view of the president that day. So he got on the bus and went downtown, getting off the bus a few blocks away from Dealey Plaza. Mr. Worrell seemed to have gotten there quite a bit ahead of when the president was scheduled to be at the point in the parade route. Initially, he estimated some 90 minutes before by his own account, which seemed somewhat odd in and of itself and not really consistent with the overall timeline. He actually tried to clear that point up later on his own, but admitted he was unsure exactly how far in advance he had arrived there. But eventually, Mr. Worrell found a spot right there on Houston and Elm in front of the school book depository. He could see the president as the motorcade made the right turn onto Houston from Maine, and then as the motorcade made the left turn onto Elm. The president would be passing within a 100 foot or so of where Mr. Worrell was in the plaza. And at that point, He had a view of the president, although in his own words, for a second time that day, he didn't get a very good view of the president. As the limousine drew even closer to where he was situated and then began to pass, perhaps 50 to 75 feet past him down Elm, at that moment, he then began to hear the shots, and he was clear that he heard four of them. Four shots. At that moment, he looked up and saw the rifle, perhaps about six inches of it, out the window of the depository. He wasn't exactly sure which floor, but it was either the fifth or the sixth floor, and it was on the far corner on the east side. He would recount that the first shot was too loud to be a firecracker, and he knew that because it felt like quite a big boom and it seemed to come out of nowhere, and for some reason at that moment, He looked up, just straight up. He could see the rifle about six inches of the gun, and he stared at the rifle. He could see part of the barrel, and it also looked like it had a large stock. Whirl would go on to explain that he continued to look up and could see where the gunman was aiming, and after the second shot, he also saw the president sloping down in the seat. Whirl's eyes were firmly fixed on the rifle between the first and the second shots. He said that he took in everything, and especially what happened in the president's car, and then he turned and started running, and as he was running, a shot fired for the third time. 
there were a lot of people screaming and saying duck, and then he heard a force shot just as he got to the corner. He would explain to the commission that all of the shots were right in succession. He ran down Houston Street alongside the depository building, and then he crossed over the street diagonally, and then he stopped to catch his breath. He was a smoker. At this moment, he was in sight of the rear of the school book depository. As he would explain it, he smoked too much. He was standing there for about three minutes trying to catch his breath when suddenly he saw a man come hustling out of the back door of the depository. This man was somewhere between five foot seven and five foot ten inches tall, probably weighed somewhere between 155 to 165 pounds, and was maybe in his late 20s or middle or early 30s. It was hard to tell because he was fast moving. He was a white man, and he had black hair or perhaps brunette hair. Whirl didn't see his face because the man burst out and began immediately running and was ahead of him almost immediately. While Whirl could not see his face, his hair was full and black and he had a dark jacket on, possibly a sports jacket, but definitely dark in color. Whirl wasn't sure what exact color it was, whether it was blue, black, or brown, but he was sure it was dark and he had light pants. His coat was open and flapping in the wind. Whirl would indicate that eventually the man would leave his sight and that he never got a look at his face, since he basically only saw him from behind. Whirl then headed back to Elm Street and began a route that would take him to a bus stop that was near his mother's office. He would then ride the bus from there out to school, and then he hitched a ride the rest of the way to Farmer's Branch, where he lived with his mother and his sister. The next morning, he got up and he turned the TV on to see if he could find out more of what had happened. And Police Chief Curry was on the television at that very moment, making a plea for anyone who had seen the shooting to please come down and make a statement. Hearing that, Whirl called the Farmer's Branch Police Department and told them what he had seen the day before. Almost immediately, the Farmer's Branch police came to his house and picked Whirl up. Once there, Whirl told Lieutenant Butler at the Farmer's Branch Police Department what he had seen, and they subsequently called the Dallas Police Department, who then came to the Farmer's Branch Police Department and took young James downtown to make a statement at the Sheriff's Office. Afterward, the Sheriff's Office would then take him back home. Worrell would reiterate to the commission that the affidavit that he made at the sheriff's department on Saturday the 23rd was accurate with the exception of a couple of things. At the time he made the affidavit, he left out the fact that while he was running away from the plaza, he heard a gun fire two more times. In other words, he didn't hear the last two shots until he was well on his way out of the plaza that day. He wasn't sitting still when he heard them. That was really just simply a clarification of how many shots he heard in the plaza. He had heard four in total. Worrell would go on to say also that at the time he completed the affidavit, and still, he wasn't sure at what time it was that he actually arrived at Daly Plaza after deciding to come into town from Love Field. He had one more minor correction. In his initial affidavit statement, he had said that the first shot sounded like a firecracker, but it was too loud to be a firecracker, and he knew that, so he should have described it differently at that time. Now, let's pause for a second and take this all in. We now have a witness indicating that someone left running out of the rear door of the Texas School Book Depository building right after the assassination. This is obviously an important lead regarding a highly suspicious action related to the assassination. And to top it off, we know from testimony we have already heard in prior episodes that it is likely that Lee Harvey Oswald exited through the front door and not the back door of the depository, making it all the more plausible that this person exiting out the back was part of the assassination team. After all, who else would be bolting in that way? 
out the back door some three minutes after the assassination. We haven't completely covered yet the process that the Dallas Police Department used to seal off the building, but we will, and there was much criticism of it after the fact by assassination researchers. We'll get to that later. But suffice it to say that for now, hearing what we did is concerning, and knowing that the building was not yet secured at all exits some three minutes after the shooting is well known, and we will hear that from other witnesses when we review that topic in more detail. Now let's pivot for a few minutes to two other important witnesses, Ronald Fisher and Robert Edwin Edwards. Ronald B. Fisher was 25 years old when the assassination took place. He lived with his wife and two children in the Dallas suburb of Mesquite, and he had been employed by the Dallas County Auditor's Office as an auditor for five years. His office was situated in the county records building adjacent to Dealey Plaza. He was reasonably educated, having completed high school, and he had taken courses toward an accounting degree at Arlington State College. On the day of the presidential visit, Fisher and a friend, fellow office worker Robert Edwin Edwards, had lunch at 11.45 a.m., and then, with the permission of their supervisor, uh, I think it was a Mr. Lynn, they left the building a few minutes later. At around 12.05 p.m. or 12.10 p.m., Fisher and Edwards took up positions just outside the records building on Main Street. They quickly realized that they would have a better view of the motorcade a little further along Houston Street, and at 12.20 p.m., they found a suitable vantage point on the curb on the southwest corner of Houston Street and Elm Street. About 10 or 15 seconds before the first car in the motorcade turned onto Houston Street, Edwards drew Fisher's attention to a man in the window of the east corner of the south side of the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository. According to Fisher's testimony before the Warren Commission, in his own words, he said, the man held my attention because he appeared uncomfortable and he didn't look like he was watching the parade. He looked like he was looking toward the Trinity River and the Triple Underpass area, toward the end of Elm Street. Fisher then provided a thorough description of this man. I could see from about the middle of his chest past the top of his head. He seemed to be sitting a little forward. He had on an open neck shirt, but it could have been a sports shirt or a t-shirt. It was light in color, probably white. I couldn't tell whether it had long sleeves or whether it was a short sleeve shirt, but it was an open neck and light in color. He then went on to describe the man's personal appearance. He had a slender face and neck, and he had a slight complexion. He was a white man, and he looked to be 22 or 24 years old. His hair seemed to be neither light nor dark. Well, it was brown, but as to whether it was light or dark, I can't say. He couldn't have had very long hair because his hair did not seem to take up much space of what I could see of his head. His hair must have been short and not long. Remarkably detailed as this description was, Fisher went even further when Warren Commission Assistant Counsel David W. Bellin asked him whether he had seen the man full face or in profile. Fisher said, I saw it at an angle, but at the same time, I believe I could see the tip of his right cheek as he looked to my left. On Monday, November 25th, some three days after the assassination, Fisher was visited at his home by Dallas detectives W.E. Potts and F.M. Turner, who showed him a photograph of Lee Harvey Oswald. According to Detective Potts' report, Fisher would not say definitively whether it was the man he saw, but he stated it looked like him. Fisher conceded that he had not seen the man's hands and so was unaware whether he was holding anything. He saw nobody with the man, but observed that there were boxes and cases stacked all the way from the bottom to the top and from the left to the right behind this man. 
Fisher's attention had next been attracted to the presidential limousine, and he watched it pass just in front of him. After it had made the wide turn from Houston Street onto Elm Street, he was watching the following cars when he heard a shot. Like many other witnesses, he likened this shot to a firecracker. He then described two further shots and made a very curious remark at this point in the testimony. At first, I thought there were four, but as I think about it more, there must have been just three. It seems like a curious statement that might be made after a person heard more from others, others that said they heard just three shots. Perhaps the litany of the official narrative by this time had begun to creep into his own psyche. Now, let's tell you a little bit about Robert Edwin Edwards. Edwards was also employed by the Dallas County Auditor's Office. He was a utility clerk in the same office as Fisher. In his Warren Commission testimony, he confirmed Fisher's account of them standing together on the corner of Houston and Elm, facing the book depository, and he described seeing one individual who was up there in the corner of the sixth floor, which was crowded in among boxes. His description of this man was almost identical to what Fisher gave earlier. A white man, neither tall nor short, wearing a light-colored, short-sleeved, open-neck shirt, average build, possibly thin, light brown hair. Like Fisher, Edwards had seen the man from the waist up, but had not observed his hands and could not say whether he was holding anything. Like Fisher, he too gave an incredibly odd answer to the question that Warren Commission Attorney David Bellin asked about the number of shots that he heard. Mr. Bellin asked him, how many shots did you hear, if you remember? And then Mr. Edwards answered, well, I heard one more than was fired, I believe. Now, if that response doesn't sound suspiciously like a circumstance where someone just decided to change their mind, given that the official story had confirmed that the true answer was something different than what they originally thought. In other words, from the get-go, he thought he had heard four shots. And now, he truly believed there was only three, and what he had thought before just must have been wrong. This same scenario was to be repeated so often in testimony, but almost nowhere in the Warren Commission reports is it so clearly and elegantly stated. Well, Bellin reviewed his earlier sworn affidavit with him, under oath, and it too indicated that Edwards thought at the time of the assassination that he had heard four shots. Both Fisher and Edwards described hearing the shots, three, but originally four in Fisher's case, and four in Edwards' case. Now, when it comes to their impression of where the shots came from, they differed, and that's interesting given that they were essentially standing right next to one another. In his Warren Commission testimony, Fisher was asked by David Bellin, where did the shots appear to be coming from? He replied, they appeared to be coming from just west of the school book depository building. There were some railroad tracks and there were some railroad cars back in there. Mr. Bellin continued, and they appeared to be coming from these railroad cars? To which Fisher replied, well, that area somewhere. Fisher then went on to describe how he and Edwards had run down Elm Street past a family lying on the ground. That was obviously the Newmans. And then up to the top of the hill where all the Secret Service men had run, thinking that's where the bullets had come from since they seemed to be searching that area over there. Bellin was caught off guard when Edward stated that he thought the shots came from somewhere west of the school book depository, and he pursued it, referring to Edward's earlier sworn affidavit. In that affidavit, sure enough, there was something different, and Bellin called it out. What would happen next is but one more example for you, the jury, to figure out when you read these FBI reports. What is true? and what is fiction. Well, here we go. 
When asked by Mr. Bellin where he thought the shots had originated, Mr. Bellin pointed out to him that in his affidavit of 22nd of November, 1963, he had stated that the shots had come from the building there, meaning the Texas School Book Depository. Edwards' reply to that was straight to the point. No, I didn't say that. Needless to say, those words do appear in Edwards' affidavit. As you might expect, and what we have stated in so many other examples already in prior episodes, Mr. Bellin did not follow up on that line of questioning. He would, as I like to say, not disturb that dog and let it stay still resting on the floor. <laughs> no doubt these two men both saw a figure in what later became known as the sniper's nest window. Their descriptions match one another and are also very close to describing Lee Harvey Oswald. Ironically, neither man could or would swear to seeing the shots fired from that window. In fact, in Fisher's case, he would say that the shots came from somewhere in the vicinity of the grassy knoll or from the direction of the triple underpass. Well, we're going to pivot now to the story of the prisoners. And I think it's best told, actually, by a concise article back in 1978 that was contained in the Dallas Morning News that was written by Earl Goltz. I think I'm just going to simply read it to you. And it also contains a little bit of narrative around some of the other witnesses that you're hearing in 28, 29, and 30. The headline is this, Witnesses Overlooked in JFK Probe. Most witnesses who may have seen someone other than Lee Harvey Oswald in the so-called Assassin's Window in 1963 were either overlooked or intimidated by Warren Commission investigators. Johnny L. Powell, an inmate in the county jail at the time of the assassination of President John F. Kennedy, recently told the Dallas Morning News he and others in his cell watched two men with a rifle in the sixth floor window of the Texas School Book Depository across the street. When he looked, the men were fooling with a scope on the rifle, Powell said. Powell's sighting of the two men occurred at about the same time amateur photographer Charles L. Bronson was filming what seemed to be two moving images in the same window. This was about 12.24 p.m., or six minutes before the shooting. Powell and his fellow inmates weren't questioned by authorities, although one of Jack Ruby's attorneys later mentioned to a Warren Commission investigator that the prisoners had a good view of what took place, and he said it might be helpful to the commission to know that there were people in jail who saw the actual killing. Attorney Stanley M. Kaufman made the suggestion to Leon D. Hubert, assistant counsel for the Warren Commission, when Kaufman's deposition was taken three months before the assassination investigation was completed in September 1964. I remember that did occur, and it sort of concerned me at the time as to why. If they were trying to find out all these facts, why they didn't go up there and talk to all these prisoners, Kaufman told the news recently. On the day of the assassination, Kaufman was representing a county jail inmate, Willie Mitchell. His client described to me exactly what happened when the shots were fired. Kaufman told Hubert, recalling it made him, Mitchell, sick and everybody else sick up there. Unlike Powell, Mitchell said he didn't see anyone in that window, in the depository, Kaufman said. Because he is black, Mitchell probably was on the fifth floor of the then-segregated county jail, which faces Houston Street and Dealey Plaza. Powell was in a sixth-floor cell, which was cat-a-corner to the sixth-floor corner window of the depository, where the Warren Commission placed Oswald at the time of the assassination. Quite a few of us saw them, two men in the depository window, Powell said. 
Everybody was trying to watch the parade and all that. We were looking across the street because it was directly straight across. The first thing I thought is it was a security guard. I remember the guys. Powell, then 17 and in jail for three days on charges of vagrancy and disturbing the peace, said maybe more than half of an estimated 40 inmates in his cell were trying to look down from the windows. The two men in the windows across the street looked darker than whites and were wearing kind of brownish looking or duller clothes, like work clothes. When the shooting started, Powell was looking down and then we kind of looked around and it, the depository window, was empty then. I didn't tell very many people, Powell said. Most people don't believe it when you tell them anyway. I never said much about it because I didn't want to get involved in it. Powell was located by the news after a tip that resulted from news accounts of Bronson's film. Kaufman said he asked Mitchell to contact the Warren Commission, but he had this I-don't-want-to-get-involved attitude. Ronald B. Fisher of Mesquite was peering up from the street below at about the same time Powell was watching from the jail. Fisher recently told the news that David W. Bellin, an assistant counsel for the Warren Commission, tried to intimidate him into testifying the one man was able to see didn't have the light-colored hair he insisted he did have. He and I had a fight almost in the interview room over the color of the man's hair, Fisher said. He wanted me to tell him that the man was dark-headed and I wouldn't do it. Oswald's hair doesn't appear to me in the photographs to be as light as the man that I saw, Fisher said, and that's what Bellin was upset about. I see it now but I didn't see it at the time. Fisher said he didn't see a rifle or another person in the window, but it was entirely possible from his point of view that he couldn't have seen another person. The man he saw was wearing some kind of a light-colored shirt, like maybe a t-shirt, and all I could see through the open part of the window was from the middle of his chest up, past the top of his head. I gazed at him a little bit because he seemed so transfixed in the way he was sitting, Fisher said. He was so still, like he was heavily concentrating on something or like he was asleep, sitting up. Fisher said the man seemed transfixed on the triple underpass at a time when most people were looking the other way for the motorcade. Across the street from Fisher, and Edwards at the northwest corner of Elm and Houston, near the base of the depository, Mrs. Ruby Henderson also saw two men in the window. One of them had dark hair, a darker complexion than the other, Mrs. Henderson said. I don't recall the appearance of the other man, except from you could see their head and shoulders, but not like they were leaning out. She said she saw no gun, but they weren't close enough to the window to be able to know if they were holding anything. Standing a few feet from Mrs. Henderson was Mrs. Carolyn Walther, a fellow worker at a dress factory across the street from the book depository. Mrs. Walther looked up at about the same time and also saw two men in an upper floor window of the depository. One was holding a gun, she said. The gunman was wearing a dark brown suit and the other man had on a light colored shirt or jacket, she said. Later, the FBI tried to make me think that what I saw were boxes, Mrs. Walther said. They were going to set out to prove me a liar, and I had no intention of arguing with them and being harassed, she said. I felt like I had told them all I knew. Another witness, Arnold Rowland, said he saw a man in a sixth-floor window of the depository holding a rifle across his chest at 12.15 p.m., or about 10 minutes before the sighting by the woman and the shooting of Bronson's film. From his position along Houston Street, about a half a block east of the depository, Roland said he saw a second man, a black, in another window on the sixth floor, the floor from where Oswald was supposed to have shot the president. Roland stuck to his story during a lengthy grilling by Warren Commission lawyers, Commission Assistant Counsel Bellin, however, elicited from Roland's wife that 
At times, my husband is prone to exaggerate. After he asked her whether can you rely on everything that your husband says? Roland's story is also important because he saw the gunman in the sixth floor window at 12.15 p.m., or minutes before a book depository employee said she saw Oswell in the second floor lunchroom. Mrs. Carolyn Johnston of Stephenville, Texas, told the news recently that she saw Oswell on the second floor as she was on her way out of the depository at about 12.25 p.m. to watch the motorcade. Five minutes later, the shots rang out. Mrs. Johnson said she never had read the FBI reports of two interviews with her, but she was surprised to learn they made no mention of her sighting of Oswald in the lunchroom. Well, there you have it. Well, we're going to pause for a moment, and I'm just going to say this. If you're a member of the jury, I think you're hearing a whole lot of testimony from all of those people that were right there in the middle of it, whose voice was lost, completely lost because it was not consistent with the narrative. And it's taken many, many years for these stories to eventually get out into the open and get publicized. Thankfully, there was enough of this buried in some of the official documents to begin with to ignite the fire. And it's been burning ever since. It's getting late and it's a holiday weekend. I think it's time to put the notebook down for the day and go find a sandwich and take a hot shower and get a good night's rest because there is much more to listen to in the next episode. I should say it will be several episodes on the topic where we tackle the grassy knoll and all that it represents in figuring out the mystery of the Kennedy assassination. Thank you for listening to episode 30 of JFK, The Enduring Secret.